a quote from uh, William Fowler. It's one of my favourite quotes, and I use it quite a lot to describe northern places. Well, uh, in, the, in the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking about the liminal correlation between the depiction of Orkney in early maps and early literature, between the factual and fictional representation. I'm going to try and give an overview of the evolving physical forms of how Orkney looks on the map and the metaphysical symbolism of Orkney and its strategic context in the emerging landscape to the developing understanding of the science of cartography, <coughs> which sounds quite grand, but really what we're doing is we're going on tour around the maps um, to have a look at how Orkney is depicted visually and whether that correlates to how it's depicted in literature, really. Uh, for example, by 1541, the name Orcades and details of up to 65 Orkney Islands were regularly appearing on globes, earlier maps and charts which usually had very crude representations of bigger land masses. But Orkney's always been very detailed, and that's the first thing that drew my attention to this. This is a beloved topic that I return to on a regular basis throughout the years, this particular one. Um, and there's a rather exocentric metaphysical landscape of Orkney that you can look at um, through the literature, and I've got a few little extracts. I don't, you know, obviously this is a big topic, so I'm just going to be skating delicately over the surface <coughs> on this. So, where is Orkney in reality then? Where is it in our imagination? Well, the usual way to find a location is to use a map. What are maps then? Well, maps are for navigation pure and simple, but they're also political constructs. Why make them? Well, they symbolize man's desire to give context to chaos and mystery, whether it be environmental or spiritual. And thus are some of the most significant of social documents. They're also some of the most subjective. In modern times, we have very different views of maps. Now here's, this is a standard map, we all recognise this, we've all had an atlas at the school. We know what this is, it's a map, Lord love it, right? Um, and then of course we, have to, we understand that the world is not flat. So we know that we have an arc of projection on there as well. So if I say maps to you, that's what you're going to think about, something like that. right? But. What constitutes a map is really hard to say sometimes, especially when you go back to the very earliest times. <coughs> about the first map we can find <coughs> is about 6,200 BC in Katalhayuk in Anatolia. And it's a wall painting which depicts the position of the streets um, uh, and the volcanoes close to the towns and so on. And it was discovered in 1963 near Ankara. And whether it's really a map or just a stylized pictogram is, is a matter for debate. But early attempts at maps are very localised. They're severely hampered by an understanding of the wider environment. Um, in Egypt, geometry was used from very early days to measure land. The annual flooding by the Nile, the Nile inundation, uh, showed the boundaries that they had there, and that's a kind of map. But these kind of measurements and these kind of depictions seem to have only been of local use, really, um, and there's no evidence that the Egyptians integrated the, map, the measurements into maps of large areas. Um, the old and oldest extant map uh, example of a local Egyptian map is the Turin Papyrus. Now, I could go on wittering about these maps for ages, but I'm going to get specific instead. So, really, early world maps, so when we see the first early world maps, they're really not about geography, they're about <coughs> religion. They're about the religious beliefs of the form of the world. There's one such map on a Babylonian clay tablet dating from around 600 BC that shows Babylon and the surrounding area in a stylized form uh, with Babylon as a rectangle and the Euphrates River by vertical lines. And the area shown is depicted as circular, surrounded by water, which fits the religious image of the world that the Babylonians believed in. So this is already evidence of location being viewed in both a, a geographical and a metaphysical context. Now, I've got a long wittery bit here about the Greeks and maps, but I'm going to leave that out, I think, because it's early on a Saturday, and we don't need to see that. So with these thoughts in mind, then where is our Okay. There we are, there's a different depiction of where Orkney is. Uh, there is Orkney. Oh, don't touch, don't touch. There's Orkney here, at the bottom, that's the top of Scotland. So it's all a state of mind, right? I'm from Caithness, which is the northmost part of Scotland. My husband's from Orkney, he's the only man in the world that's ever called me a woman from south. Right? It's all entirely relative. So, chronologically speaking, we move from vague politically motivated maps and clear geographical literary references to the end of the world and so on, to maps that reflect more accurately Orkney's actual location with a converting more metaphysical description and significant. I'm sorry for anybody from Shetland, I'm afraid it left less of a mark on early maps, um, so therefore I am concentrating on Orkney today. 
So geographically speaking, the location of Orkney is very clear. Lie, we lie at the northern tip of Scotland, where the North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean meet. There are 70 so islands. Actually, that's a bit of a debate in a pub on a Saturday night. 70, 90, 65, Ivy, who knows, right? It depends what you classify as an island, and that's a whole other paper. <laughs> um, so the, Ar the Orkney Archipelago covers an area of 974 square kilometres, and it can be divided into three distinct regions, the North Isles, the South, the Lake South Isles, and the mainland. And the majority of them are mainland. Okay, now, in an interesting perception issue, the main island of, of Orkney is referred to as mainland. Scotland is another country, and they do things differently there, right? This is mainland. So we've got perception there of where the, the central locus is when we're talking about Orkney. Um, and uh, the Norse actually originally referred to mainland as Hrosthorsh, <coughs> it's a meets horse island. And we sometimes find the erroneous name Pomona on old maps, which is of course the Roman goddess of fertility and gardens and so on. And that, that I suspect is a bit of a joke by some worthies and a Scots cartographer, I think. A good old joke that one. Anyway, but the thing is, the interpretation of Orkney in maps and literatures appears to be in a state of permanent um, disequilibrium. The written non-fictional references come before the maps or are concurrent with the earliest of them. But the written fictional references all come after Orkney's geographical location is established through cartography, particularly that of Ptolemy. So the perception is a key driver here. So let's just look at some of these maps and see where Orkney comes in the historical maps moving some, from some key world projections to more specific views of the islands themselves. Right, this one is Pomponius Mela. You can see a huge amount of detail of the southern hemisphere. <laughs> Great lump there. Now, I'm going to be careful not to touch the screen, but Orkney is here. It says Orcades. It's up at the top there. Pomponius Mela. Now, that's one of the first examples. It dates from AD 40, and it talks of the Orcades. It, delineates 30 of them. So by the first century AD, the islands have been called Orchids, the Latin name Orchids. And this is the earliest surviving record of the name. There's a lack of detail, but note that there is a mention, you might not be able to see this, but there is a mention of Toul, which is even more northerly there. And then we discover that Pliny refers to 40 Orkney Islands, 40 Orchids, and gives specific names to them. How is this happening when we're on the edge of all things? And they are way down there in Greece or Italy or wherever they are. Why, how do they know? How do they know? Okay, let's move to perhaps the most famous one of them all, and that's Ptolemy's world projection. Oh, well, that's not seeing it there. It doesn't work. 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 It doesn't Marvelous. We're all a lot better off <coughs> pigeons and quills, I'm telling you now. Right. So we have Orkney is up here. This is the world projection. This is what people believe for about a thousand years is what the world looked like. Okay? This is Ptolemy's. And he used <coughs> data from a lot of his predecessors, particularly Marinus of Tyre, which was very inaccurate, and of course the Roman geographer Diodorus Siculus. And the earliest surviving mention of the Orkney Islands is actually found in the accounts of Diodorus Siculus. And he wrote about 56 BC. And he set out to record the journey taken by um, the Greek sailor Pythias of Massilia, who is thought to have sailed around Britain in 325 BC. So Diodorus <coughs> was writing 300 years after um, Pythias travelled. And Pythias' own account of this journey concerning the ocean has been since been lost, but has been extensively quoted from throughout the centuries. Um, and Diodorus described Britain as triangular, which we can see on the map here. And the three points of this triangle are Cantium, Valerium, and Orcas, a, na a place of immense waves. Yep, we'll testify to that. Happy to have that one. So around 148, Ptolemy actually produced an early map of Britain. Again, using earlier sources, Ptolemy named these three headlands. Um, and he also named some of the Orkney Islands. Dumna, for example, which might be the high island, which might be Hoy. It's likely that it's Hoy. And around, um, around this particular time, it shows that Orkney is being used as a reference point for a particular um, positioning issue, because uh, Orkney was actually of um, great strategic importance of the time. Now, the size of shape and shape of Orkney in these maps, notice this when we look through them, is completely out of kilter with the actual reality. So Orkney specifically 
considerably larger. In that's um, Ireland there, that's Britain, and there's Orkney along the top. And it's it is not to scale, and that's because it's representing its significance in the world stage, particularly. Okay. So if we look at this, can we then map the metaphysic change in perception from violence and remoteness, these northerly places, to spirituality and peace through the literature of the north? Well, Tacitus, the Roman writer, documenting the campaigns of his father-in-law, Agricola, <coughs> states that after the defeat of the Picts at the battles of Mongropius, Battle of Mongropius, Agricola dispatched a force to sail around the northern tip of Britain. And this expedition, which took, about, took place around about 84 AD, um, saw the explorers experience favourable weather and return unscathed, uh, having first, quote, discovered and subjugated the orchids hitherto unknown. This may not be factually accurate. I don't think they actually, it's a bit of Roman spin doctoring. Um, <laughs> far from them being conquered, as Jerome's Chronicles tells us, in Hadrian's time, Juvenal wrote, why have we moved armies beyond the shores of Ireland and the recently taken Orkneys and the Britons content with minimal night? And later, when the Roman Empire was falling, they were seen as the home of the Picts, not the Romans. And Claudian said, in jest, drenched with routed Saxon blood were the Orkneys. According to Tacitus, these islands were beaten by a wild and open sea, and Agricola thought that the water was thicker there. I think that must be the whirlpools. You know, he got as far as Thurso and he thought, no thanks. So stay where I am. Thank you very much. Okay, but having said that, despite several early historical accounts, the forces of the Roman Empire never made it as far north as Orkney in any great numbers, if they ventured this far at all. However, the references to Orkney, qua Orchids, as the northernmost point of the Roman Empire, firmly fix its physical location and its metaphysical location as the edge of civilization and of the known world for centuries to come. And then something really interesting happens. And this is one of my favorite maps. This is the cotton map, Anglo-Saxon world map from 1040. Um, and this appears in a copy of a classical work on geography. Now, it's clearly outside the largely symbolic medieval mapping tradition, but equally it's not based on the Ptolemaic coordinate system. East is at the top, right? Um, but Jerusalem is not in the centre where you'd expect to find it in the medieval map. It's not. Um, and Garden of Eden, which is often on these maps, is nowhere to be seen. It's divided into the three continents of Europe, <coughs> Asia and Africa, with the Mediterranean Sea in the centre. Okay. And usually all the waterways of Africa, not just the Red Sea, are depicted in red and the mountains are in green. It's a little bit subtle in its shading, but hopefully you can, you can see that. The depiction of the Far East is ambitious, it's got to be said, including India and Taprobani or Sri Lanka. The latter depicted according to the ex exaggerated classical uh, conception of its size. Unsurprisingly, Britain is depicted in some detail. Great Britain, unusually by medieval standards, is shown as one island, albeit with an exaggerated Cornish Promontory, here we are. That's Britain there. Marble sticking out there. Okay. Um, and uh, Mona Anglesey and Ireland. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is Orkney. Wow. <laughs> That's why I like it so much, Reagan. Mm. Um, and the prominence given to Orkney, which is really equal in size to Britain, go Orkney, right? clearly indicates a political agenda that underlines the significance of the islands, which is backed up by the entries in the Anglo Saxon Chronicle. Uh, for example, the only entry for AD 46 in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle concerns Orkney. <coughs> this year, Claudius, the second of the Roman emperors who invaded Britain, took the greater part of the island into his power and added the Orkneys to the dominion of the Romans. This was in the fourth year of his reign. Now, when this Anglo-Saxon map was made, it would reflect the fact that the Orkney Yardom was at the uh, peak of its powers, really, and they said, so it is reflecting its political significance, if not its geographical location in any way whatsoever. Uh, and there's also the sense of an east-west projection in this map, and that is kind of backed up a few hundred years down the line by a quote that I have here from Trials and Crusade, Book 5. Um, that Greeks be of high condition, would it well, but certain men shall find as worthy folk within Troy town, as cunning and as parfait and as kind, as be being betwixt arcades and inns. Mm -hmm. East-west projection. Um, and allied to this, you've got a perception of location based on proximity to a larger neighbour. Um, and you can see that in the following quote from um, Chapter 5 of Orkney, the saga with his east-west projection. Readily these noble people will, will obey thee as thy subjects. Use your power with moderation. Hjaltlanders, as I mentioned for Shetland there, your fame is well known. Till we had thee fierce in battle to these eastern shores, there was not any prince on earth who conquered these far distant western islands. Okay, now we're come to another favourite map of mine, which is the, obviously the medieval equivalent of a tea towel, souvenir tea towel. 
This is uh, the map that, that was issued after Columbus had travelled to America. This is without doubt a souvenir tea towel of a map. It bears no resemblance to anything particularly accurate there. It leaves out all the um, rivals to Spanish power in the seas, so there's no Netherlands, nothing like that. But there are, by God, Orkney Islands up there. <laughs> the, the, it's not a map for navigation, it's a political document, basically. And the great amount of, of detail on the islands in this map is to show the improvements in navigation and also indicate that Spain is at the forefront of them. Fair bit of detail in the depiction of the Orkney Islands at the top there. Um, but this is placed in the context of the new discoveries and the Arctic regions. So Orkney is no longer the most northerly bit. We know something else. And literature from this temporal point reflects that. And actually, Carl, I used two of my quotes yesterday, so you might recognise what I'm going to do. Right. Now, I'm going to move back to the world scene. Uh, the map here. This is actually more specific. We're narrowing our focus down. And this map is a little different from the preceding ones. Um, in that it's a map of part of this of the world, not a whole world projection. So Valtzimala gives a fairly accurate representation of Orkney. There we are. Top there in this map of Britain. Um, and it's far more accurate than his representation of the British mainland. If somebody appears to have cut Scotland in half and it's fallen over. So, <laughs> a bit of a worry. Um, and again, Orkney's most northerly point given in this map. And we can see this move from a westerly marker to a northerly one, reflected in the sonnet by William Fowler, which actually gives me the title for this paper, 1560 to 1612, in which the pathetic fallacy gets an early airing. In Orkney, upon the utmost kernel, cur excuse me, can't speak English, upon the utmost corners of the world and on the borders of this massive round, where fates and fortune hither has me hurled, I do deplore my griefs upon this ground. And seeing roaring seas from rocks rebound by ebbs and streams of contra writing tides, and Phoebus' chariot and their waves light round, while equally now night and day divides, I call to mind the storms my thoughts abide, which ever wax and never does decrease. For nights of dull days, joys I ever hide, and in their veil doth all my will suppress. Stroic wheel her thank for to deserve. And there we go. Um, so this is now Orkney is becoming. A reflection of the state of mind. So, moving on. Now, this is another nice one. This is Blau, and a lot of you will be familiar with this. This is my last map. Conscious of time there. You're fine, you're fine. We've only got two speakers. Mm -hmm. in yes, session. I know, but I'm, I'm getting yeah. rigid with my time keeping you. <laughs> right. um, now, Blau's depiction here in 1564, this is very popular. I myself have an original copy of this, which um, I pretended to have bought for a christening gift for my son, but actually it's on the wallet. You'll get it at some point, I am sure. Right, um, so Blau's depiction of Orkney Shetland actually looks very similar to what we see in the maps today, in a way, but there are still noticeable inaccuracies. Greater specificity does not necessarily lead to greater accuracy. It's not oral projection. But we do find Blau rather charmingly gives narrative to go with the maps, and this is what he's got to say about Orkney. Mm. From the Hebrides to the northeast, if you follow the coast, you will at length see the Orkneys. Now, Orkneys. More or less 30 islands spread out over the intervening ocean. An old parchment so calls them as if Argat, that is, as it understands, above the Gitter. I should prefer above Cat, for they lie opposite to the Cath region of Scotland, which because of the promontory they now call Caithness. Um, and then he goes on to follow up descriptions and he mentions the, island, the islands called uh, Ide, uh, Hoy, and so on. And then he goes on to, to tell you a bit about the actual Arcadians. In their daily life, the common people, especially in the countryside, still retain much of the old uh, parsimony, and so they enjoy great and almost continuous health of mind and body. Diseases are rare among them, and many die weakened only by old age. Ignorance of luxuries deriving from honourable poverty does more among them to safeguard health or to restore it if lost than does the art of physicians of whom they have none among other peoples. Most have a quite intelligent nature, capable of learning any skill or discipline, Many are distinguished by a tenacious memory, an elegance of form, and a tallness of stature. Who knows what they're looking at there? <laughs> um, cheerful in countenance, strong and spirited, and they display strength and a fearless spirit for fighting privately or publicly when the occasion presents itself. They are of themselves acute speakers according to their education, or avid listeners to and retailers of what is put forward acutely by others. They either express or try to express the humanity and civility which they've taken from Scots who live among them. Hmm? Uh, even the country people listen carefully to sermons and by mutual repetition of what has been heard recall them to mind in a surprising manner. So the later cartographers changed their mind. No longer is this a blood-soaked land. No longer is this the end of the universe. 
was much more in, the, in accordance with Renaissance and humanist principles. Okay, so um, our tenure as the most northerly inhabited part, point of reference was eroded as navigation improved. And we can see that, and this is the quote that Carla gave yesterday from Alexander Pope. I think this is the one anyway. Ask where's the north? At York it is on the Tweed, at Scotland in the Orcades, and there at Greenland, Zembla, or the Lord knows where. Things have changed. So no longer the northerly limit of the civilised world. And that's where you see, just to finish up, this reflects the general sea change in cosmic perception in the 17th century. In his studies in the spiritual crisis and revolution of the 17th century um, from a closed world to the infinite universe, Alexander Cowie reduces the changes made at that time in the conception of the world to two main elements, the destruction of the notion of cosmos and the geometricization of space. And this new cosmology set aside the geocentric world of the Greek, the original cosmos, and the anthropologically central structured world of the Middle Ages, replacing them with a decentered world of modernity. And this fundamental transformation had several consequences, the most significant of which were the displacement of the mind from contemplation and teleological philosophy to the mechanics, mechanic mastery over nature, that'll do, and the rise of modern subjectivity, which brought with it a new awareness of the world and the rise of romanticism. Just to finish up, of course, there's one last mention of Orkney that I'd like to mention. The Orkney serves as a marker in this romantic context too, albeit both in an anti and a pro-romantic sense. The key revelatory scene in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein takes place on Orkney, um, an, an Orkney island of great um, sort of windswept uh, poverty and so on that reflects the, the state of mind of Victor Frankenstein, who is of course Swiss, who equates the, the life of Switzerland as order and society, and Orkney, as Carla memorably said to us yesterday, showing the degeneration of civilization as you go further up. Um, uh, I'm not going to read that quote, uh, but the last time I read it, uh, lots of people thought it was probably Chappensy. Uh, it's, it's described rather grimly. But just to finish up, Orkney then is a powerful enemy to be subdued, a nirvana, a haven, the end of the world. Where and what it is, you can decide. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. That was a marvellous talk. Um, any questions, comments? Well, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, and then yeah. Well, one wonders, um, you know, before they got into proper survey. I mean, one laughs at the funny shapes that Scotland mm -hmm. had. But you imagine going out on foot or with a horse to try and get it right. And, and do we have any idea how these early maps were in <laughs> practice created? Well, we do know that um, some early maps of Scotland, the, the, like the blue ones, and so they did walk about do do measurements and drawings, and took a great deal of time. Kenzie, for example, spent a lot of time mapping out. So uh, it's foot slogging, basically. But before that, I mean, but before that, they're just making it up. Essentially, well, they were relying on seafarer tales. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they would, they would, you know, take contact. Yeah. yeah. You know, for example, Marinus, his kind of instructions are, sail 10 days north, marvellous. Uh, and so you have to extrapolate from that, and that's why these maps are saying something else. They're talking about knowledge and they're talking about uh, political things and so on, but they're not actually, the, the actual navigational information is contained in the oral narrative a lot of the time, or in uh, the descriptions written down. Yeah. That's why it's so interesting. Yeah. You know, somebody's 10 days, somebody else's 15 days. Yeah, I'm just really interested in the depictions of Orkney from such an early stage. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, you were saying that partly that's because it's kind of helping them to fix mm -hmm. the, the idea of north. But there must be a reason why Orkney's chosen to do that. I mean, we know that Cornwall is important from early on because of the tin, mm -hmm. um, and so it's an important trading place that you have to be able to get to and from. But, I mean, what is it in Orkney that makes Well, you know, Caroline, I thought about that, and I think it's the fact that you can see it from the mainland. So that, yes, okay. It's there, it's out, it could be, I don't know, but it could be as straightforward as that, that it's out there. Shannon, and it has, as you say, got this horrendous <coughs> stretch of water in between, which maybe mm -hmm. then, because that, that description of how the water being thicker is exactly what you get if you try to cross the 
kind of bug in a bug way or so close to the water that you can touch it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Having done that, it's pretty horrendous. Well, that's very heroic of you, rather. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it was yeah. a converted lifeboat, which mm. gave me a false sense of security. Yeah, I mean, it is really interesting. For, I mean, I know it's just a tale that's making its way back to Pythias or whatever, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I just, I do think it's just, it's, it's the visual thing. Yeah, that might work. Mm -hmm. But isn't that also because most of them, as I say, if they were relying on some pair of tears, I mean, that would, would have been obvious. You know, it was an obvious ship. Yeah. But we know that there is a trade of steatite from Shetland to Orkney. Trade by trade, very loosely, there's transport of steatite from Shetland to Orkney from about 2000 BC. So if it's relying on Steve Ferrer's tales alone, one assumes they might have put in Shetland. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there's a sea route where people are going to and fro from It depends what narratives they're, they're exploring, so what, what, whose journey is it that they're, that, I mean, these are journeys from south coming up, they're not, they're not, they're not taking they're a not point to speak to Shetland, <coughs> yeah. whereas they can speak to Arcadians, yeah. 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 There's arm waving going on, yes. Yeah. Well, this is a, a, a random, from a known seafarer, but perhaps the, the extent of them and the number has to do with the fact that the seas around them are quite shallow and you better watch out. So you better know the lay of it. There may have been many small stories about islands that have recently disappeared, like Hargruna in um, Sandy and things. There may have been many more of those around too, so you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think um, I am a sailor, and, and headlands are much more important than the bays in between if what you're doing is going along the coast. And so I can imagine that, you know, in the sailor's descriptions, the headlands were very important because they were sort of hinge between what side and side. And ever since I started on the island of Sunday school, so I've had a very clear picture of all for me as the sort of hinge between the Atlantic and the North Sea. And if you're not going to go through the Pentland first, and I would guess the hazard of that might be understood early on, then Orkney is the next one, is the next best sort of turning point. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can imagine it being mm -hmm. an important place. Mm -hmm. But there'll be a number of things Both to understand and as a place that you were going to pass through. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just a quick one on the maps of self Do you make any comparison to modern day maps? Not so much the maps, but like you talked about, some of them were religion, some of them were trade. Is there any comparison to modern maps? Boy, I, I'm working on taking it right the way through yeah. and, and looking at it, just, just doing yeah. a little extra for yeah. today. But yes, it's, it's interesting because, well, modern maps, I mean, there's that marvellous thing that we just decided we'd put north at the top of the map. Yes. And of course, in the Arabic world, it's, it's other. Yeah. And that was an arbitrary decision. That's just mm -hmm. the way that we do it, which is why the, 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 the blow map, for example, looks like an east-west yeah. projection because it, it technically is. It just needs to be turned into. So you can do that, it's almost like you, you're rotating it through the years around to where it is now. But our maps are just as subjective as the old ones. Do you think the future of the map is, is slowly, yeah. do you think it's slowly going through a revolution? Well, I, it's interesting, <laughs> but our maps are subjective. <laughs> yeah, yes, of course. And, and the projection of them is subjective. The way yeah. that, you know, Britain is depicted in atlases, for example, that's a whole thing to have. Africa, like that, yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah, the very large, it's not accurate. Yeah. Um, and even something as silly as the weather map on um, That's what it was in mine. That's what I thought. Right. I got chopped off the map last night on yes. the TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the weather map. Yeah. But a friend of mine was teaching mapping skills to some kids here in Orkney before they went up to, to somewhere in England. And he gave them all the map and said, now, which way do you orient it? And they all said, towards the coast. Oh, interesting. And he was like, uh, we're going to be walking in the mountains in England. I'm not sure the coast is going to be really useful. <laughs> yeah, it's just interesting, isn't it? It's just how they, they do that. Yeah. So there's a subjective orientation on the thing. Yeah, I think we've got time for one more. Yeah, it's, it's more of a comment. I've recently read this book because I was attend, going to attend this, this conference, The Venetian Navigators, I think, yesterday. I didn't know whether you had read it, which is a fascinating story. And it's a story of a map, which was Created, we don't know. It was certainly published in mid uh, the 16th century, but probably dates back to mid um, 14th century. So it's an interesting story. But that map, whether it is you know a literary hoax or whatever, shows the degree of interest that Venetians had in the north, and that certainly included Orkney. Now, from that map, you don't know what is Orkney, Shetland. There are strange names. It's a fascinating map.
the debt map, the so-called ZAM map, apparently had a huge influence on lots of navigators and map makers <coughs> until the 18th century, if not the 19th century. It was in the 19th century that eventually people said, okay, it's a hoax, it doesn't work, and so forth. But it shows the, the degree of attraction and interest Venetians down there who had, oh, as you all know, mm -hmm. you know, an empire that included contacts with Turks, with the East, and so on and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. It's a fascinating story. I don't know much about it. No, I must uh, get it <laughs> from you. I've not come across that. Yeah, I, know the I, I would be interested to, yeah. to know, to, you know, to find out what you make of the oh, yeah, story. Well, shouldn't and, give and, me the and, title. How you set know, <laughs> into this context. Mm -hmm. See, this so is it's more an encouragement yeah. to let me know more about this. But this is the trouble with this topic. Every yeah. time I think I've got yeah. everything, there's something else comes up. Yeah. And I have to go back and fit it, weave yeah. it into the tarp yeah. of the story, basically. But thank you, I'll get the details yeah. of that. But the Teddy Robin Lamp actually travelled all over this place, went to Shetland, met Brian Smith. Brian Smith is actually you know, the artist is mentioned in his book, and he met people here. So it's interesting because it's, it's a parallel journey between the Zen brothers and I'm sure you will enjoy it. I will. Okay, you can stop there. Just get an old. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you. That was really <laughs>